That GT stands, of course, for Grilly Type, the renowned Swiss foundry behind these and many more celebrated and often used typefaces. Founded by Noel Loy and Thierry Blancpain in 2009, the foundry has over the past decade cemented itself as a true leader in the industry. Now, we're delighted to have Noel joining us this evening to talk through how the studio was founded and to explain the process behind some of the foundry's most recognizable typefaces. Um, Noel, please turn on your audio and video so we can uh, say hello as well. Hi. Hi there. <laughs> uh, thanks for properly pronouncing my name. Excellent job. <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much. I, I, I tried. Um, it's great to have you. Are you. You're calling in from Lucerne, is that right? Yes, and uh, hometown and also cor corporate headquarters of Grilly Type in Lucerne. Amazing. Okay, great. Well, we're very excited about this. So thank you very much for joining us uh, on Nicer Tuesdays mm -hmm. Online. Um, I'm going to leave it to you to kind of share your screen and, and uh, take us through some, some amazing work, really. And um, again, everyone else watching, uh, yeah, if you have any questions for Noel, um, please do put them in the chat and um, I'll try and get around to them afterwards. But yeah, Noel, over to you to, to yeah, share your screen and start the presentation. Sorry. That's all right. These are the, the yeah, technologies uh, sorry, we're all used um, to with uh, doing these things over. <laughs> this one's better. Huh? Okay. That's perfect. Great. Um, it's amazing. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Noel, as you know now. And I'm going to talk today a bit about Grilly Type. And uh, before I start going into projects, I'll actually talk a bit about what Grilly Type is. Currently, Grilly Type is a Swiss type foundry, but it actually started around a decade ago, uh, around here. This is uh, Bern, Switzerland, um, at art school. And I studied there together um, with a friend of mine, Thierry Blancpain, here, and the two of us when we were a little bit younger. And together with other friends and fellow students, we started Grilly. And Grilly was initially the idea that we really were enthusiastic about the work we produced in art school and we wanted to have a platform where we could present that work because we we found it a bit frustrating to just do all these projects and then keep them and um, just in the school context so with that platform we produced that this kiosk where we sold books and posters and magazines and fanzines. And we also decided we're going to sell typefaces. So this was more than 10 years ago with the starting days of Grilly Type. And nowadays it's a bit different, but it's always really important to point that out because um, often younger designers will ask you what you did and how you got in a position of um, doing interesting work. And I think it's often following just your passion and being very enthusiastic about it. Now, in the current time, this is how Grilly Type actually looks. Um, this is the current setup um, of Thierry, uh, Lind, myself, Reto, Tobias, and Katya. And um, we are working in a very remote team. So actually, Grilly Type never met in person, all of us together. But we're trying to make that happen this year, although it's a bit difficult. And um, we worked in the last uh, decade and a bit more um, on various projects. I can safely say that you probably saw already some of our typefaces. And this is also an interesting part about designing typefaces that your, your design is traveling a little bit around the world and is being used in different contexts by different organizations and different brands. And of course, it also was being used by It's Nice That before uh, they did their redesign. But it makes me really sad that it's not a Grilly typeface anymore. <laughs> and I will not talk too much about our uh, client projects, but I will talk a bit more about our own projects and uh, where we're coming from in terms of design. Now, it's at the start of how to explain a bit Grilly type is always um, our background in being a Swiss design studio. And of course, I'm showing here the classic uh, Swiss graphic design Bible, the Grid Systems book by Josef Müller Brockmann. And um, we see ourselves and the studio a bit in this tradition of Swiss modernist and Swiss minimalist graphic design. And 
and what the Swiss graphic design is in my mind is it's usually it usually follows a very clearly defined concept and the concept defines how you implement all the details and um, so it's basically a master plan and then all the pieces have to kind of fall in place and that's one thing that's important and the other thing is obsession with detail if you're doing minimalist design or also like the swiss modernist design it's very often about details that matter and to give you an example of how much details matter i, I always like to show that is and um, this sheet i received from my local government and it was about local elections and they sent me with my voting documents also like this manual that basically instructed me of how I should properly tick the box. And it really clearly also says that if you don't do it correctly, your vote is gonna be dismissed. So this is like about the extent of how square Switzerland is. So if, if you wanna ever visit the really hardcore detail obsessed square place, please uh, let me know and visit Lucerne. Um, so what is actually a typeface when it comes to type design? I think details matter, details and concepts both matter a lot when you're designing a typeface. And sometimes if uh, people ask me what is actually typeface or what is type design, um, to explain it simply, it's basically a, collect a collection of minimalistic two-dimensional sculptures um, that you're putting in a sequence and then they if these sculptures together they can convey a message and the typeface itself is a tool that you're using to do graphic design or you're using to do communication design so one aspect of the typeface that's always important is that it's a really finely crafted tool in our case we sometimes take I think up to 10 years um, to really refine a typeface to the point where we think the concept is sound enough and the details are all perfectly implemented. And since we're spending that much time on designing these typefaces, we also like to educate our audience about how much thought and detail and care went into this design. So we try to really take it to like basically the maximum you can go into details. And that is one important aspect when you're um, designing a typeface, you're designing a tool that somebody else then will use to do new design. And that's one part that's really important. But the other part of a typeface is the typeface is also a design piece in itself. And it has not only a kind of a technical quality, but it also has an emotional quality. The typeface is kind of like a person. It has its own character. So whatever design you will uh, do, it, the typeface will have a strong influence on it. And with our typefaces, we spend a lot of time in building visual worlds where we think the typeface fit into. And we pay a lot of attention to telling really the story behind the typeface into communicating its personality like is it a colorful typeface is it black and white is it funny is it serious and a lot of people i think know these mini sites we designed for the typefaces that are basically telling the story um, of the typeface and explaining it better to the audience and i will pick one typeface and in particular the our latest release gt flex up and show you a bit on, on that example very quickly how we implemented that typeface into a website so the interesting thing about gt flex is actually the way um, typography is manifested and throughout history there's been many manifestations for typefaces or typography it's been chiseled into stone and there was a period where you could do typesetting with lead typesetting and then that technology um, faded a bit and then you had photo typesetting and that this and then that changed into what we have right now is a digital typesetting so a typeface the typeface actually completely left in a way the physical world and just became uh, kind of vector shapes and what I find really interesting about that is that it, it has no longer a solid shape it's more maybe like this 
or a digital typeface is also could be a little bit like this, something fluid, something that can change um, its appearance. And we really wanted to make that um, the center of FlexArt, to not have a solid typeface, but a kind of a liquid typeface. And the way the typeface works is with a uh, new font technology, you can build a typographic space instead of a typeface. So GT Flexa has kind of three axes width, weight, and then the angle. And you can just scale the typeface in these different axes. So in a way, Flexa has no real shape. It just flexes around, hence the name, of course. And um, it, it's really interesting to play around also. We created the mini site that explains a bit how the design happened, the, the individual characters, they were quite roughly designed is quite a sturdy typeface and a lot of the decisions have been guided to make it usable um, in different widths and weights. And another thing that we found really interesting when releasing the typeface was um, responsiveness. I mean nowadays we usually when we read something we read it on different devices in different formats and different medias. Um, here uh, some sketches I made, I thought it would be interesting how could a typeface work, for example, on a watch or on a phone or on a, on, on a big external screen. And together with the uh, Swiss animator Josh jo Schaub, we kind of developed these animations that really show how this technology can be used also in an interesting matter, manner in design. And we also did a little bit more playful kind of exercises with what, what could be interesting in design if a typeface can flex. And what, another thing that was really important for me when we released the typeface was to play with uh, works of movement because the typeface is not static. It should really convey this message of, of movement always on the go. It can turn, jump, bounce, wiggle, dash, and so on. And the website we built, this is already the last slide of my presentation, um, shows a bit the history behind the typeface, the design space, and you can also actually play around a bit with the typeface and make it do different um, kind of movements. So I was trying to be very on time with 10 minutes. I hope I managed to um, fulfill the Swiss cliche. And I have here the last um, slide of my presentation to do some blatant self-advertisement. If you're um, interested in anything I showed you, um, please go and visit uh, our Instagram, Twitter, or visit the websites I showed you. And if you're really curious, you can also just send me an email and I will take my time to respond to you. Thank you very much. Amazing. Thank you, Noel. That was incredible. Um, yeah, you can stop sharing now. but. Um... Such interesting stuff. I feel like it's so rare to get that kind of insight into how you uh, how you build a, a typeface like that. So thank you for that. Um, we've got a few really interesting questions that have come through. These were actually submitted before the event um, by people as they bought their tickets. But one question came through was, um, this person is a big fan of not just your font library, but the way you approach licensing, um, making font sets and beta versions available for creators to use and try out before licensing. Um, this person asks, yeah, well, what are your thoughts on the rest of the industry? Um, who often appear to restrict full use until licenses are purchased. Um, yeah, feel free to be as... Uh... <laughs> well, I think the good thing is that I've been a design student myself and know how, like, how lax sometimes people deal with fonts. So, I mean, I remember like my first year in art school, I think someone dropped this zip file on the server that had like, I don't know, 20,000 font files in it. And of course, as a student, you cannot afford... Um, you cannot really afford to license typefaces if you want to use them for a project. So we came up with this idea of um, providing free trial fonts. It's basically a reduced version of the actual typeface. So like very simple philosophy, try before buy. And I think that's also kind of a, an offer for people not to just pirate the typefaces, but to use the trial fonts and then once the typeface is actually being used to then license, properly license it. 
Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, another question has just come in, which is, is really interesting about kind of how you work with clients. Um, mm -hmm. Going into so much detail, at what point do you share designs with a client? And in a very busy world where clients want things immediately, how do you then get the time you need to kind of perfect something? Because you clearly do spend a lot of time perfecting things. Well, I think it's actually, you know, like most, most of the time when we work with clients, it's usually on behalf of an agency that has a client and then we're kind of the, the partner of the agency. And um, with typefaces, I mean, we in the design world or maybe graphic designers, you know what a typeface is. And my grandmother never really understood what I was doing and she thought it's just an excuse to, for being unemployed. And often even with clients, they might not really understand why they should pay for a typeface or why having a particular typeface. And I think um, when clients work with us or design students, it comes in really handy that we do a lot of educating in design and typography. And we are very um, keen on, you know, package all it. We're always packing everything up in a concept and where you can argue why certain decisions have been taken. And in that case, actually the details, they help you to argue on behalf of the typeface. It's much more difficult if you just present um, some design, but you cannot really talk about it or you cannot really argue why you took certain decisions. Right. Um, one final question comes through from, from Kieran. Um, do you still start from sketching, I guess, using, you know, pen and paper or pencil and paper, or do you work straight from digital now? Um, it's, a, it's an often asked question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I, I use um, both actually, and I, I, but I personally think in our age, it's not really a, a difference so much. I have now an iPad, and even though it feels a bit different to draw on the iPad pad, I think it's still pretty similar. So I've, I like that analog and digital, they all kind of blur together. Fair enough. Okay. Well, listen, Noel, thank you so much for, uh, for your time and thanks for, for joining us today. Um, it's fascinating to see. Yeah. If you wouldn't mind turning your audio and video off.